as we dig into Hebrews 12 and this next chapter or this next season for me is your identity. Are you a son and daughter of God and recognizing where you are to then get in that correct heart posture where every week there will be an opportunity to do a traditional altar call where because you will always recognize I had it this morning on my morning run when I'm without headphones without my watch and I realized man activities can step into religion and it stops being about relationship and it starts being about my run or listening to a certain worship song or doing things in a certain way or having a certain number of followers anytime anything is focused on something not God you're stepping into religion so this chapter and season is going to be all about whenever something comes up and you're like Lord yeah that part of my life that part of my habits, that part of my behaviors has slipped into religion or is not fully yielded to you. It's that opportunity in the end just to run and get down and go, God, make that change. Remove that and make that change. I've got two versions out. So I'm not sure which one I want to go through. We're going to be going through he Hebrews chapter 12. Now, this isn't the modern Amplified. There's two versions of Amplified, and this is the original Amplified from the 60s. Therefore, then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So I'll be adding paraphrasing from their paragraphs. Witnesses who have borne testimony to the truth of Jesus. Let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance. Encumbrance is an un unnecessary weight. And that sin which so readily, deftly and cleverly clings to and entangles us and let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us looking away from everything that will distract us from Jesus who is the leader and the source of our faith and also is the finisher he for the joy of that was set before him endured the cross despising and ignoring the shame and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God just think of him Jesus who endured from sinners such grievous opposition and bitter hostility against himself reckon up and consider it all in comparison with your trials so that you may not grow weary or exhausted losing heart and relaxing and fainting in your minds you have not yet struggled and fought agonizingly against sin nor have you resisted and withstood to the point of pouring out your own blood and have you completely forgotten the divine word of appeal and encouragement in which you are reasoned with and addressed as sons my son do not think lightly or scorn to submit to the correction and discipline of the Lord, nor lose courage and give up and faint when you are reproved or corrected by him. For the Lord corrects and disciplines everyone whom he loves, and he punishes, even scourges, every son whom he accepts and welcomes to his heart and cherishes. You must submit to and endure correction for discipline. God is dealing with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not train and correct in discipline? Now, if you are exempt from correction and left without discipline in which all of God's children share, then you are illegitimate offspring and not true sons at all. Moreover, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we yielded to them and respected them for training us. Shall we not much more cheerfully submit to the father of spirits and so truly live? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for only a short period of time and chastised us as seemed proper and good to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our certain good that we may become sharers in his own holiness. For the time being, no discipline brings joy, but seems grievous and painful. But afterwards, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. It yields a fruit which consists in righteousness 
in conformity to God's will and purpose, thought and action, resulting in right living and right standing with God. Verse 12. So then, brace up and reinvigorate and set right your slackened and weakened and drooping hands and strengthen your feebled and palsied and tottering knees and cut through and make firm and plain and smooth straight paths for your feet. Yes, make them safe and upright and happy paths that point in the right direction so that the lame and halting limbs may not be put out of joint but rather may be cured. Strive to live in peace with everybody and pursue the consecration and holiness with which no one will ever see the Lord. There's so much in that short passage, that first half of Hebrews 12 or the first 70%. The biggest thing that I have seen in my walk with God so far is that people do not like to be disciplined. It's a, it's a flesh problem. A flesh problem does not like to be disciplined. But... If you are a born-again Christian, you are not a flesh problem. Flesh problems are no longer your problem. So our excuse of that's just the way the rest of the world is, is not a valid excuse in the presence of God. Why? Because our faith is in Jesus. He is the beginning of our faith and the finisher of our faith. Now, what does that mean? Because it's a, it's a complex statement, but it's the very simple statement our faith began because we heard of what jesus did we were not in the days four five thousand years ago of abraham and enoch and noah our faith began in understanding who jesus is and he is the finisher in our faith because we understand what he then finished so when we understand our faith is in jesus and what he did and therefore because of what he did we are now born again the problems of the flesh are no longer our problems they're no longer our excuse does that make sense it's not a valid excuse for example yesterday i was in a ratty mood we had a little bit of a, a, a grumbling because i was in a ratty mood i was in a very ratty mood I didn't sleep again. I haven't been sleeping so good for what feels like forever. But I think it's been about three months. My sleep has been very temperamental. Which I can live with. Now I'm doing a course. During the week I can live with temperamental sleep. But like Saturday, Friday night. Am I sleeping on Saturday where there's no alarm? It's like I want that to be good. And it's been. I can't remember the last time I had a good Sabbath night's sleep. So I was cranky. And I remember I woke up about 4 a.m. And I'm like, no, I will stay in bed. God, you take enough time during the day. I will stay in bed. I need to sleep. I'm waking up at 10.51 to have my Zooms. And then I'm back up at 3. I need to sleep. I'm staying in bed. And this last week, I didn't sleep because I had a really painful neck. The whole week, I had a painful neck. And then on a Friday morning, God healed my neck. Um, but interesting revelation that's a different story but Friday morning God healed my neck I was praying and then I just felt fire going all down my spine da -da, gone so I'm like Lord I need to sleep I haven't slept all week six just before six halas I give up I'm going to go down make my coffee sit I read the Bible for about half an hour then Danielle comes down and off we go. We start the day. And I'm ratty. I am ratty. I'm very ratty. I'm very snappy, very moody, very temperamental. It's like someone who hadn't, like I'm a fat person who hadn't had food in a while. It was really... <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I'm trying to create an analogy that's not going to cause offense to anyone. Okay. I'm like a two-year-old child who's missed his nap. Yeah, that, that's literally what I'm like. I'm really like, nothing Danielle can say or do is going to make her not have, not me, have me be moody and angry. Hey, so I get off. I go do all the things that need to be done. Um, and uh, I get back and I, I'm better now. I've, 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 I've chilled out. I've gone out. I've ministered to people, shared about Jesus. Even though I'm in a ratty mood, I'm still... Sh t sharing to trolley people about Jesus and doing my best and I feel better I come back I eat and now I'm really better 
And then this morning, the revelation hit me. My excuse was I was tired, but that wasn't the problem. The problem was I chose not to start my day in God. Now, every day I start my day with two and a half hours dedicated to God, apart from Saturday, where Saturday is I'm going to wake up. I'm going to wake up when I want. This is my Sabbath day. If there's time before the dog walk, I'll spend that having coffee and reading the Bible. But this is my day of rest. This is my day where I need to recharge my batteries. And uh, that's that. But I realized this morning, the problem was not that I was tired. The problem wasn't that I had a bad week. Those were excuses. The problem was I didn't start my day in God. And when I don't start my day in God, guess what happens? Ratty old Eloy takes over. Because I haven't started my day sitting in the spirit of the Lord. And I was really ratty. It was a good one. Like really was like I wasn't even born again, to be honest. It was one of them ones of I knew I was in a bad mood. So I was like, I'm just going to go be extra charitable. Like, for example, I always give this thing like. If you know God's talking to you about money and I had it a while ago, we went out, we took some people out for lunch and then we had a and I, oh, God's been money is always a wrestle with God. And we took some people out for lunch and I was like, this waiter was really bad. <laughs> like a really bad waiter. And then it'd been a long time since we'd gone out for food and we always do our best to tip generously. And then the Lord was like, well, you've been blessed with money this season. You're going to tip generously. And I was like, no, he's been a terrible waiter. He didn't even give us our drinks. <laughs> and I was like, Woof, that's greed, right? Double tip. Like, hala, so you recognize something and you just, you just do more. So when I recognized I was ratty, I was extra generous yesterday. The, the market people saw it. They mugged me off on their prices for sure. Um, well, I'm not going to argue but that's what the flesh does the flesh will always justify and you feel justified because that's just the way humans are men are addicted to pornography because we have things that need to be emptied sorry to be vulgar but it's, uh, it's how I used to think I'm a man I've got to do stuff it's how men think you justify it but when you're born again there is no more justification so what happens what happened yesterday I was a ratty human being because I didn't sleep, because I had a really poor breakfast. And because I had a really poor breakfast and because I didn't sleep, that's why I was ratty. No, I was ratty because I didn't do what I should have done, which was start my day with God. That's a revelation. And you can see the difference between not born again and between a born again spirit. Make sense? The non-born again spirit will always go, that's just the way it is. That's the way humans are. I got to sort myself out first. That's my, it's the way the, the world is. But the born again spirit goes, Lord, what was the problem? I recognized I was wrong. What was the problem? And the problem or the solution to the problem is always going to point you to one thing, God. And that's why it's so important in those first two verses, in verse two, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Let us lay aside, verse 1, every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. Who's ever run a race before? Who's ever done it? Anyone done an assault course, an obstacle course, something like this? Yeah. And they're not easy. Now, the author of Hebrews is saying the walk with God is a race. When you link the race to what Jesus says, how does Jesus describe the walk with God? It's a narrow path that few will find, and this is difficult. So imagine a narrow mountain path from Myanmar. There's mountains in Myanmar. Yeah. Yeah. So imagine the hardest mountain path in Myanmar. That's a secret one that not many people find, but it leads you to the most beautiful heights in the mountains. So that's normally what happens when you find these random little mountain paths. If you can survive it, it's the most beautiful reward of a view. And that's what Jesus says the walk with God as. And that's what the letter of Hebrews is saying. It's a race where sin is readily available to trip you up. And the only way to overcome that is to keep your eyes on Jesus. So it's in that first step in your life, recognizing when something goes wrong, where are you looking? Are you looking to the excuses of the world? Or are you looking to Jesus? Now, why do we then look for Jesus? To be corrected. Because that's what the rest that the next part's all going to about correction. We look to Jesus not for 
a feel-good hug. He does give those. We don't look to Jesus for a quick fix. We don't look to Jesus for the, I'm forgiven, so now I can just forget it happened. Well, that does happen as well. All those things do happen. But you look to Jesus for the correction and the direction. That's why it's keep your eyes when you're running or walking. Walking, not as relevant. But definitely when you're running, if you're not looking where you're running, you will fall. I had it last week. I was running and it was at the beginning of the run. And I was like, I almost aborted the run because of this. And I'm just, like, just doing like a look around. And then my feet stumbled. And I'm literally going down. And luckily, I used to do martial arts. And I just ended up doing a cool ninja roll. Whoosh. Like over my shoulder. And then carried on running. And I was like, that was so cool. Did anyone see that? <laughs> but that came because I, I took my eye off the road. And it actually almost happened again. That's why you have to keep your eye on Jesus. Because when you're looking for correction, he will go, from here, it's a narrow path. It's not a straight road. It's windy and it's difficult, which means he moves a little bit. And as he moves, you then change your direction. And then he moves. But you're always slowly moving forward. And that's why you look to Jesus. Because you recognize where the stumbling is starting to come. And you go, am I a son and daughter? Or am I an illegitimate child? Because if in your life, you've gone your whole life and you haven't had correction from God, you have a problem. You have a real problem. If you're unable to accept correction, you have a real problem. Because it says later on to accept correction with joy. Not because correction is easy. It's painful. It sucks. It's hard. But what does it lead to? Verse 10. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a short period of time and chastised us. But he disciplines us for our certain good that we may become sharers in his own holiness. It's through his chastisement that you get to share his holiness. So if you're not being chastised, you're not getting to share the goodness. The goodness is not prosperity here on earth. The goodness is righteousness, which is what he then says as well. And what is righteousness? To be in right standing and relationship before God in a holy manner. And that's why you, that's why you embrace chastisement. You know it's not easy. It's not easy. It wasn't easy for me this morning to go on a run without listening to music because that had become a luxury. When I first started doing my God runs, there was no music. There was no watches. But it came in and I'd realized that had become my source of pleasure in the run. And it had stopped being time with God. Coming off social media has not been easy because it's breaking in an addiction. But you recognize the reward that comes from that, which is, more right standing with God. As you have more right standing with God, you have better relationship with him. The better your relationship with him, the more the eternal living well comes up. That living well is the eternal peace and joy that irrespective of the surroundings you're in, it doesn't affect you. That's why it's a journey. That's why it's a race. That's why it's a path because you have to learn what your chastisement is. You have to learn how to embrace the chastisement. You have to learn how to embrace the discipline. So when you start walking with God, it's never easy. And it never gets easier. It actually gets harder. Because of the point in walk where I'm at, where it's now about getting rid of technology and coming off social media and just going back to just a really simple lifestyle. Like we was even talking this morning about, let's just get rid of Wi-Fi. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that, Eli. <laughs> don't do that. If we go back to the time of King David, there was no distractions. Go back to Abraham, there was no distractions. We go back to 2,000 years ago in the book of Acts, there was less distractions. Yeah. But it's a comparative of when you think about how many distractions we have today compared to then. Social media... And then it's not just Instagram, it's Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. And then from on top of that, people are then distracted on so many other things. WhatsApp, so many different yeah. WhatsApp groups. Yeah. I'm worried about how many likes. I'm worried, oh, what has my favorite TikToker pu published recently? What's my favorite YouTuber doing on their gaming? What's my favorite Twitch follower doing, you know? So in a world where there's so much distraction, God will start to strip them all away because he's meant to be your one. He's a jealous God that does not share. And as a child of God, if you are a true child of God, you should be expecting that chastisement and that disciplining to, uh, so you start to look like his son Jesus. And we have to really remember that the modern world is not 
how God wanted us to live. This is so far from original creation, it's not even funny. And it's not evolution, it's corruption. My father's side were all farmers in the mountains in Spain. There's still no Wi-Fi in that area. Like, really, you can barely get internet there. But you go back to that place of living, it's totally different compared to the rest of the world. It's totally different because there's no distractions. The people there aren't focused on phones. They've just got old, most of them are dying off now, but they've just got old things. Most of them have mobiles. They only care about looking after their goats, yeah. looking after their grapes, making their wine, making their cornbread. It's simple. If you give the gospel into the hands of a simple life, how your world changes. And you know, I was reading a testimony from the course I'm on. And we are the ones that limit God. We are the ones that limit God. And the story was, you know, a woman was, she was giving out presents to children in Mozambique. And then she said to the girl, what do you want? And the girl said, I want beads. And she looked behind her assistant. Do we have beads? And they went, we've only got old dogs. God, I don't want to tell her we don't have beads. This poor little girl wants beads. God, give her beads. I don't know how you're going to do it. God, give her beads. Beads was in the bag. And the girl got beads. If God can multiply bread and fish, if God can bring the dead to life, if God can bring fire down from heaven, why can't God make beads? Because we're the ones who limit God. God can do whatever he wants. And I was listening to another testimony. And this one really made me laugh. The guy was in a very bad mood. And he got dragged to go pray for someone. He was very bad mood. But the guy had dragged him and said, listen, God's told me, you're going to heal this man and this man is going to bless your ministry. He's going to bless your life. You need to go pray for him. And I was like, no, I've got evening service. I don't want to go. Look, God doesn't want us to go. All these problems. And the guy said, no, I'm taking you. Let's go. So the guy goes in. The guy's in ICU. He's about to die. He's all plugged in. And he goes, in Jesus' name, be healed. Slaps him and just walks out and then says, that man's going to die. And just walks out. Just walks out. Sunday he's preaching church. Who's in the front row? The man he slapped. And, he went, and the guy went, when you rudely prayed for me, fire surged through my body. I pulled all the wires out and I came chasing after you, but you'd already left. But when you smacked me, <laughs> the fire of God healed me and I had two brand new kidneys and the doctors discharged me that day. I was about to die. And God's told me to give you this and this was then used to purchase a piece of land which the landowner died and he said this was only allowed to be used to be built for a church. We limit God. He limited God in his mind. He'd said, this is my plan. I need to go do this. I can't do that. I'm going to be too tired. This man's already dead, whatever. But God wanted him healed. It didn't matter about the guy's condition, as in the guy praying. The guy's heart posture, the guy's holiness at the moment, the guy fast. It didn't matter. God wanted it done. So whether the guy did the best prayer in the world or just slapped him and said, in Jesus' name, be healed, the guy got healed. Can you imagine? Imagine me going up to someone, you're about to die. In Jesus' name be healed. This guy's dead anyway. Man, <laughs> like, I'm amazed the Lord didn't just smite him down then. But we're the ones who limit God. And why? Because we don't know God. But if we go through the process of correction and knowing God, beads can turn up in a bag for children. Food turns up for the poor. Miracles start to happen so things can change around you. But you have to be willing to embrace the correction it's never nice no one likes to be corrected i don't like to be corrected when god corrected me this morning about the way i've been running i almost fell on my face i probably should have fallen on my face and got on my knees and cried but i wanted to do my run without stopping a bit of pride and ego turned up there for sure but will i now be running with my watch and headphones again no because i realized that that's his holy time and i was claiming it for my benefit and we have these things always that will come up. You know, I say this story many times. My Saturday night TV habit. The Lord said that stops. But I like watching animals and having a pizza. Why? Well, it's, it's not the end of the world. 
but the reward from him was so much better. You know, last night, we then, instead of where pizza and TV would have gone, we spent an hour just doing Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. It was wonderful. And that's much better than watching an animal program with a pizza. But the process of getting there was not easy. It was painful. Many nights sat there going, oh, what to do now? Oh, let's just have some ice cream. Let's just go to bed. Let's just sit on Instagram and scroll pointlessly. Painful. But then you then s- we stepped into that glory that was that deeper relationship with God. Now, disciplining and submission, and this is where it's so important, and I was going to speak about this before 1 John, but I'll bring it in today. This is where the church body comes in. The reason people leave churches is because they don't want to be disciplined, especially within the charismatic church. Because the charismatic church, if we were to classify, we are a charismatic church. The charismatic church doesn't put rules in place. We don't put discipleship programs in place. We don't put a 10-step process to salvation in place. We don't put a testing process for ordinations. We just trust the Spirit of God. But that process of trusting in the Spirit of God leaves flaws. Because instead of me going, Simlan, you need to walk, I just go, Lord God, Holy Spirit, please convict her to walk. Thank you in Jesus' name. And we just leave it at that. But not realizing we all have a responsibility. As I said, was it last week about calling out sin and is there blood blood in your hands? Was that last week or the week before? Last week. It's about how as leaders, two weeks ago, how as leaders and people we have responsibility to call out sin, to help chastise and correct each other. But then our role is to be looking to be chastised. But as we are looking to be chastised, we're also looking to chastise. Because that's why iron sharpeth iron in Ecclesiastes. No, Proverbs. Ecclesiastes is two strands. And that's an important part of church. As Ronnie knows, who's been here the longest, I openly chastise and rebuke. Your role is to accept it, apply, and move on. But it's your choices. But the same thing, it's a two-way street. I always say, if you see I'm stumbling... I want to be chastised. She does it all the time. Bless her. (laughs) Never nice for her because it (laughs) results in me getting even more grumpy. But in the process of me getting grumpy, I know the Lord eventually does humble me to listen where I then say sorry. Because it's never nice. I'm still waiting for her to apologize as well, by the way. Left me hanging for breakfast. (laughs) Still hasn't apologized. Just ran up and had a shower. Left me hanging doing all the housework. (laughs) But that's the truth of a Christian walk. If you are not yet at that position where you're looking to be chastised or you are not being chastised or you're not happy being chastised, you are not yet a son of God. Where does it say it? It says you are illegitimate children. Verse 8. But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. You will receive discipline. You must receive discipline. Your role through disciplining is to move forward. If your eye is on Jesus, guess what you're going to move towards? Jesus, until you are fully filled with Jesus. That's why you run towards him. He's the beginning of your faith. Your faith started when you saw him. And he's also the end of your faith because you know that's where the end is. The end is in him, in his resurrected glory. So chastisement is not to give you more success, it's to make you start to behave more like him. So that corporately as a body being chastised and disciplined by the Lord, you will start to represent him more and more and more. That as a Christ body, you can start to change the world around you and shake the gates of hell. But you don't get to that by just saying a prayer. You don't get to that by going for a swim and being baptized. You get to that through a process of correction, which is painful. Suffering is correction. So when you are in a bad, painful position, it's because you are suffering. It's because you are being corrected. The Lord uses all things for his glory. So if you're sick, what is the Lord trying to teach you? If you are poor, what is the Lord trying to teach you? If you are hungry, what is the Lord trying to teach you? If you are overwhelmed, what is the Lord trying to teach you? 
When he teaches you, it's your job to apply and not repeat. Don't be like me, the naughty child. I start off with a hundred lines. By the time my parents gave up giving me lines as punishment, I'd gotten to over a thousand. So in England, if you're naughty, I will not lie. You write it out a thousand times. I'd, I'd gone to a thousand. Why? Because I'd worked out if I tape four pens together, I can do four lines at once. When I was like, when I was, <laughs> when I was six or seven, thousand lines, yeah, no problem. Yeah, thir- I'll be done in 45 minutes because I'd worked out you write the same word across a whole four pages will be faster than writing I will not lie. You develop a habit. I, 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 will, 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 and you just cross four pens. Boom, done, thousand, easy work. I'll be done in 30 minutes. I'll be back to PlayStation. But no, by that point, no, because they'd given up because my, my ears were now fully desensitized so they couldn't like... They, they couldn't pull my ears and throw me back by my ears anymore because I would just pretend it hurt. It didn't hurt. <laughs> but don't be like the naughty child. Your role is not to get around how to sin. It's about getting rid of the sin through the chastisement process. It's not about in one day you are a pure, perfect person. No, in one day you are made pure and perfect before God through Jesus, but you as a human being now need to be cleaned. Your life now needs to change. And that's what people forget. It's not instant transformation. It's instant transformation before God so that God can now talk to you. It's now your job to work out your salvation. And if you're not working out your salvation through chastisement and disciplining, you are not a son and daughter of God. Now we'll just revisit verse 11 and 12 as we close. For the time being... No discipline brings joy, but seems grievous and painful. But afterwards it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. A harvest of fruit brings conformity to God's will in purpose, thought, and action, resulting in right living and right standing with God. That's what the fruit of righteousness is. The fruit of righteousness is conformity to God's will in purpose, thought, and action, resulting in right living and right standing with God. So then, author has said, no one likes to be disciplined. The fruit of discipline is this, right standing with God, knowing his mind, walking with him, holiness. Here, here, how do you get there? Verse 12, brace up, reinvigorate and set right your slackened and weakened and drooping hands and straighten your feeble and palsied knees. Cut through and make firm and plain and smooth straight paths for your feet so that the lame limbs may not be put out of joint but rather may be cured. That final process is strengthen yourself. Encourage yourself through the discipline and set your path straight. So what does that mean? For me, I'll use social media. It meant no more taking my phone to the toilet. I go to the toilet, phone has to stay outside. My new step is the phone is only allowed in two places, the kitchen counter or the office. It doesn't go with me anywhere else anymore unless I'm leaving the house. I'm making my path straight. I'm putting rules in place to make sure I don't go back to those old habits. To keep it simpler, old school, how I used to be, alcohol. I will no longer allow to drink alcohol. Therefore, it all leaves the house. I will never again buy alcohol. And for that first period of time, I will not visit a bar. I will not walk into an alcohol shop. Why? Because I don't want to be tempted. You make your path straight. It's not he makes it straight. It's not he gives you the power. It's you make the decision to strengthen yourself. It says if you have weak knees, you make them strong. Okay, go get a knee brace. Ugh. Knee brace on. Ugh. Right, knees are up. up. My back, right, let's get a back brace, bit of tiger balm. All right, okay. <sighs> I now need to walk that way. Right, well, I don't want to go that way. I don't want to go that way. Let me make sure there's barriers. Either side, done. Barriers there. Okay, right. And then as you straighten up, you can then start to walk because you're getting closer to him and you're now past the problems that were there. And that's what that verse means. So as we go back into one more song, 
there are three things that can sit on your heart during this time. The first thing it can be is poop. I don't receive disciplining. Bugger. That's a problem. Oh, what else am I going to say? Uh, that, that, that's what would go through my mind. It, if, it, if I was a hyper-grace Christian and I read that, I would literally probably be cursing, saying the S word, going, I'm not a child of God. I need to become a child of God. Boom. Run. That would be number one. Number two is, Lord, yeah, I'm sorry. That thing you've been nagging me about by going for prayer walks and I know that's for my own good. It's, Lord, I know you've been trying to discipline me. You've been trying to correct me on this thing. I'm sorry, Lord. Show me now. Let me keep my eye on you. I accept that disciplining. I accept that correction. Let me now walk towards you. That's number two. Or number three, it's, Lord, I suck at being disciplined. I need to learn how to be disciplined. Let me be disciplined and let me learn how to straighten my knees. Let me learn how to make my path straight. And let me learn how to walk that path of disciplining. Or I guess number four would be, Lord, your word is totally wrong. What about all these grace scriptures and stuff and peace? You know, this is a nice song. But that really is the heart posture you should now be coming into this because it's not that I'm good and I've done a lot for God. I've done nothing. But even a simple thing like running with a watch with headphones was an idol that stopped me having a relationship with God. Because back in the day, when I used to preach, I would not plan a sermon until I went on that run. I would run and I would have a conversation with God about what message he wanted to give. And back then I used to preach, rule, one portion from the Torah, one portion from the prophets, one portion from the New Testament. And all three had to have the commonality message to prove that God is an eternal God. And I went through a season of six months of preaching just like this without doing any Bible study. The Lord would give me the scriptures and as I ran, they always worked. But back then I never used headphones. Back then I didn't track my distance. I just ran the way God told me to run. And if I died, I died. And a lot of the time it was in 50 degree heat. But I never died. But I added distractions to assist my God run. The assistance became my falling. So we all do it. Now I've got the uncomfortable process of learning again how to run without headphones. But I look forward to the reward of what I know that's going to come. Because I've been hiding from that, if I was to be honest to myself. Because I know on those runs, he's going to have me try and talk to people. Why? Because at the corner that I always avoid one run, there's a nice grassy bit where people always hang out. What a wonderful place to preach the gospel. I've seen it. It has steps. Do you know the corner I'm talking about where the fountain is? What a beautiful place to stand with a guitar and preach the gospel. And I've run, I don't like going to that corner because God shows me that vision every time. I'm like, hell no. And then from there, you go a little bit further down. You're at Jamira One Mosque where so many tourists are. So many tourists. Wow, what an opportunity to just sit there because it's an open courtyard. They sit there and evangelize. Hey, you're here to look at this mosque. Let me tell you about true salvation. Hey, no, I ain't going to go see that vision. I don't want to see that direction. I raise a hallelujah. And that's how I was living. So we will always re- co- receive correction and it's never nice because it hurts your heart. Lord, I've been a mug. I've been mugging you off. I've been making excuses. I'm sorry. And I know this is a silly thing, but this happens all the time in my life and in Danielle's life. Sometimes it comes from her, which is even harder. But God will correct through people and through spirit. 